This video is brought to you by Diamond Pacific Tool Corporation. Diamond Pacific is America's favorite diamond tool, wheel, and lapidary machine manufacturers. For nearly half a century, Diamond Pacific has set the industry standard for diamond lapidary equipment. Join the majority of professional lapidaries and choose Diamond Pacific products such as their Nova Wheels, Pixie, Genie, and Titan Gem Makers, as well as their wide selection of other high-quality lapidary diamond products. Check out Diamond Pacific today and find out why they're considered America's premier diamond lapidary tool manufacturers. I know I do. Can't take it with you. Well, he probably will, someone will get it when he dies. Or make a turquoise tomb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just bury himself <laughs> in there. Twice as wide, the two. I'm gonna run to the restaurant and get that. Stay here. This is fantastic. So this material has to be older, I, I would imagine, right? Yeah. A lot of the fox I see is not nowhere this nice. Well, it, it is what it is. Only a small percentage is top. If you, if you don't mind me asking, when you cut turquoise that's highly silicated, do you use Zam like if you were going to cut yeah. something? Zam? Because yeah, it's still soft, but this is like agate. Oh my gosh. And this is silicated fox. Beautiful. What would a piece like that go for? I see it's marked. Only nine fifty. You could cut it. I wouldn't cut it. That's a collector's piece. No, it just I mean, times. I said it. But I think I'm going to recut it and try to get a little more blue. Do a little bit of contour carving. Do you use wheels when you're doing your um, you know, contour carvings? I, I cut these on all just regular flat wheels, but I got a bunch of it that's really steep valleys that I got to cut by hand with uh, diamond bits. Fantastic. This is, I mean, this is like the stuff. It's, it's probably six and a half in hardness. Maybe six, six to six and a half. Your neck, you obviously made that if you made those. Yeah, yeah. That is great. That's another piece I just wear that one, so it matches. <laughs> those jade. are awesome jades. Yeah. Those don't look like they're mass produced in China. Where do the jades come from? Oh, that that kind of looks like uh, maybe BC on the back. Yeah, this is Washington, that's BC. Oh, wow. But a friend of mine made them, but he passed away. So you're a man who's not afraid to use Zam. I like <laughs> no, this is, these are all polished as them. But they're polished down to about 20,000 diamonds first. So okay, not 3,000, Sam. 20,000. Yeah. That's a big difference. No, it is. Um, this isn't Labradorite. That's Spectralite, right? Yeah, I think it's Labradorite. I don't know. I thought it was the Finnish version from uh, Finland. It has the black matrix opposed it to the green matrix. Be. I just bought it. Cut, I don't know. I, I just assume it's lab there, right? but maybe not. And you're, you, is that uh, Bruno or is Bruno. that? Bruno is stunning. A lot of people don't understand natural color Jasper love, but people who like Royal Sahara, Biggs, Bruno, yeah, cool. we're, we're obsessed with brown Jaspers, and some yeah, people. But are so spoiled on, you know, Labradorites and Ocean Jasper, they might not appreciate it. But look at this, this is turquoise, this is Verisite, but this is almost as good and it's just as hard. I would have thought and they were the same way, line. Way cheaper. Oh wow, I love your castellated bezels. Yeah, you have to do that on a real high dome uh, cab, otherwise the bezel just folds over itself. Oh, that's I, I like I like this as much as this. And this stone's like 80 bucks and that stone's 300. <laughs> so This isn't also Bruno, is it? This is Willow Creek. Willow Creek. I almost thought maybe Royal Imperial from Mexico. He's a man who loves his natural color jazz because that's beautiful Lake Superior there. Whoa, check this out. Some beautiful, is that, I think those are Australian ribbon varicites. What's that? Is this Australian, the ribbon varicite, is it Australian? Look, these two, yeah. It's stunning. This gentleman's got great taste. That down there is also Australian. 
Amazing. How long have you been cutting? A long time. I don't know. 40 years, 30 years. This is the Australian. This is a nice spread. Different Australians. Uh, I bought my first piece from Broken River in Tucson, and I paid a lot more money than you're selling for the, those over there. No, 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 I'm selling it fairly cheap. I had a problem with mine. I, you know, I tell people, soft stone crumbles, hard stone shatters. And some people told me maybe to soak it or something and just maybe take your time with a centered blade, high quality, thin. Start out with a slab about that thick or a little thicker, about this thick on both. You back both sides with... Uh... Devcon? What I use is a record album, epoxy <laughs> awesome. on. So if you epoxy it on both sides, then you split it with a, a thin blade with a lot of water and, and the blade has, everything has to be running true so there's no vibration. And then you open it up and you get what you get and it holds together better. And if there's little fractures, you can either work around them or fill them with glue. But if you just try to saw it up, it'll just all crumble apart. The record's a brilliant idea. And speaking of the records, I did speak with you. I talked to you in Quartzite. You probably yeah, did. Yeah, you were in Quartzite. Yeah. And I was admiring your record backings. Yeah. And sometimes you leave the grooves. The grooves are there. <laughs> well, maybe not on that one. Well, I don't know. Some, Some of them. them. But that's it's, it's fantastic. It's actually a lot more affordable than DevCon, too. You know, if you're at a swap meet, you can get a box of 50 for 10 bucks if they're all thrashed and scratched up. And you, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't chop up the Zeppelin and the ACDC. You use Buster Beagle's bagpipe yeah. banjo playing no, band. And... I, no deep purple, <laughs> no Led Zeppelin. I use like... Polka and classical records. Yeah, Christmas music. <laughs> yeah, Christmas music. 21 jazz, um, great American jazz standards from the Although 20s, I, 30s, I and 40s. I'm not a big ACDC guy either. <clears throat> so all of these are hand cut. Uh, they just don't have that calibrated look that people mail stuff away and get back from the Philippines and Jaipur. But also, they're getting paid to work so fast they couldn't compete with your finish. Well, they, a lot of these are tumble piles, so I can see the tumble. When it's real hard, I have to do the tumble piles. Well, that makes sense because this back is just as shiny as the yeah. front. And then people but, who wire wrap love them because the back's so Polish. But it still has a good girdle. If you're a smith, you could still bezel it pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, because I make jewelry, so I know what to, how to, you know, how to make a girdle even. Holy and, smokes! These are only five dollars each, and these are only ten dollars each. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! I gotta get. I'm gonna. I'll buy. Watch out, sorry. I want that part. one. And on this one. I'm thinking this one. Maybe this one. Oh, or maybe this one. This has got to be the one. That one. Gotta get that one too. Did you see where the first one? Oh, here's the first one. That's 10, this one's five. Stunning. Even though you're tumbling, tumbling is a fine art. Yeah, it is. You gotta know how to do it to get good results. And um, where cabbing, faceting, and silversmithing is becoming less and less of a trade secret, I still feel like tumbling, these old timers who are really good at it, they're not giving their secrets away. I, I used to work for Highland Park and um, Sherman, one of the owners, was telling me they offered an old-timer, the best tumbler in America, either a lot of money or a bunch of equipment, and he wouldn't do it. Even though he was up in age, he was going to go down with the ship. 
Didn't want anybody to know his tumbling secrets. There's a few tricks, but it's not really any big secret. Mm. Mm. Lavik, Southern California. Do you ever go out there? I'm used to doing this rock out there. It's not much out there. I've never had the pleasure of... Uh, I, I find some small pieces in the cram box, but... I used to find uh, crates of it in a big piece of that this. But, you know, the last time I went out there was about eight years ago when I found, like, one crate for all day. Are these old stickers for the Bisbee? Or is it just an yeah, odd... These are Bisbee. Oh, oh, wild. Yeah, this lid's on backwards. Nice chocolatey matrix. Oh, that makes sense. It's the other way around. Look at that. There was a at uh, Tucson at Jogs. One of the only person people I saw besides Ernie who had this wanted thirty dollars a carrot. It looks this, like this is stabilized, but still, it's, this quality isn't top. It's not worth. You know, it's worth about two bucks a carrot. It's still definitely worth collecting, even though it's stabilized, in my opinion. Bisbee's one of the turquoises that people that don't know turquoise know. Kingman, Sleeping Beauty, Bisbee, uh, Royston, and then the second tier would be more like Morenci's. That's when you're starting to get into it. Kingman's um, probably the most popular. And, you know, Bisbee's just because of the, the lure. The high-grade, high-grade Bisbee's so beautiful, but... Where can you get it for less than, you know, your old iron? The biggest piece I've ever seen, it wasn't in person, it was on a video of uh, John Hartman. Has a, has a giant chunk he loves to, to tease people with. i seen, like, in the Tucson <laughs> show guide or something, a, a big piece. Uh, I'm sure Ernie has probably some hard grade business somewhere. Anyway, I, do you have a card by chance? Okay, I want to let people know if they're interested in any of your fantastic works. Give him a shot on his email there. Stanley H. Wall. Thank you so much, Stanley, for your kindness, brother. We're here with Richard Kosurik. This gentleman is all over the best gem shows in Colorado. You're in Tucson. You're in Denver. You go everywhere. Albuquerque. All, Albuquerque. Almost all the Colorado shows. And you have, you always have some of the highest quality cabochons. These aren't mass produced, thrown into a tumbler with scratch backs and stuff. But uh, you were just telling me about something very special that you have. That's the golden quartz. And it's not called golden quartz because it's gold color. It's golden in it quartz. It is gold. That's the <laughs> real gold. That's all from California. 16 to 1 mine. 16 to 1. Yeah. What an old time name, huh? I know. It's like the odds. It's like, okay, what are the odds? 16 to 1. It's pretty good. Yeah. Actually, that's terrible odds, I think. <laughs> but this is stunning. I wonder how they would polish it. Like... Would you use cerium? Would it mess up the metal? No, I, that's a good question because I used... Um, you polish this? Yeah. Oh. I, I used diamond on that. I used a diamond bell. Okay. So, so it's dry. You know, it's, it's so not... Just, just high grit, fine diamond belts. 50,000 grit diamond belt because... Uh, Compounds would get stuck in there, Zam or... Exactly. And uh, you can actually smell, it has a funny smell, but when you're cutting it, you can smell the gold. Oh, trippy. Yeah, it's definitely like, you go, that's gold. You just know it's gold. It smells like melt, it smells like what you expect, melting gold. Mm -hmm. Native silver. It, uh, where is the gold from? It's 16 to 1. Oh, yeah, you just told no, me. No, that's okay. <laughs> California. And uh, where's the silver from? The silver's from Cobalt, Ontario, from the uh, silver sidewalk. That was the three-foot vein of silver that ran for, I've forgotten how many hundreds of yards, but it's famous. Yeah, it literally looked like a, literally looked like a sidewalk. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was... I heard a funny rumor, I don't know if it's true, 
that when you are allowed to go hounding in Canada in certain places, that the rules for collection is twice your body weight every year. I'm not Some sure. like old queens and king no, rule sure there. That. So that's why you bring your chubby friends. Yeah. <laughs> Did, you must have cut this as well because it's a similar quality to the finish. Is this turn your machine black? Um, you know what? It's it, yeah. It's actually the worst uh, mineral for for like being dirty. It literally uh, every, it stains everything black. Um, to the point like your hands, you can't get them clean for a week, and. I've even like brushed up against you know uh, the wall, the drywall, and had to repaint it because I couldn't get the black off. Oh my goodness! There's mostly white, but sometimes black marble. Since it's so, I imagine the gold because gold's in there, it won't patina. Will no. the silver patina? Um, none of this, none of this tarnishes or patina. Other than I have a little bit of the mohawkite, and the mohawkite will patina. I need to repolish those. That's the only one. The others are real stable. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. So yeah, it varies because also, um, like in that first piece, the little edge of it is nickelene, the, the rose gold color. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it's the native silver. Same, you can see again, because they form together, some of them actually have both minerals in it. That one does too. Oh, man. So essentially you've got the native silver, the nickelene, the white marble, and the black marble. And then this cover light, is this the Montana stuff? Yeah, I just don't have much left, that's it. I, that's a good thing. <laughs> I started off the year with over two trays and I thought I'd make it all the way through this month and I'm down to a few pieces. Now, when you're cutting the um, cover light, is it the same as the silver and the gold, just wheels, no compounds? Uh, exactly. Most of the time I don't use cerium because it's pretty, it's too aggressive. When I first uh, met Rich years ago, it was actually through our good friend Sprite. Do you know Sprite as Sprite or do you know him as Anthony? Anthony. <laughs> There's people on YouTube like, I will not call a grown man Sprite. That's okay. <laughs> and it was, um, the first material I noticed of his was this fantastic Russian amylite pyrite. Lynn is showing me shirts, heavy metals, just like what's in my brain and blood. Would you like this? <laughs> sure. Thank you, I'd love it. And um, let's take a look at some of these. I see maybe two or three people who have these um, in Denver, and the other two people are Russian. Because I, I used to be their biggest distributor. Really? Yeah. That makes sense because um, you just always have this stuff, and it's obviously harder to get now because of all the shenanigans. Yeah, it's impossible to get. I'm just buying up. Uh, other collections when it's available. So I bought this from you, and when I see this for sale, like this from someone else resold, easily $150, $200. So you're keeping it really real. Um, these are all cut in Russia, right? Yeah, they are. They don't, uh, when I first met them, they, they would sell the rough. Really? I've never seen the rough and, once. And then uh, they started, because the production's so low, they started cutting it. And let's face it, the Russians do an outstanding job. I think just uh, in general, they're one of the, uh, you know, just the average Russian lapidarist is really good. Yeah, they have a huge scene over there. I mean, for hundreds of years, well, thousands of years even, it was mostly facets, I would say, was the big thing. And like Lynn, has, Lynn's, Lynn used to go to Russia and she would say that even the costume jewelry over there, it won't be diamonds, but it won't be glass like in America. It'll be quartzes. It'll be, you know, inferior rubies and stuff. And they don't do costume jewelry yeah, like we do. I've just, I've just seen some crazy Russian lapidary work and I realize how uh, great it is. Um, I tried to polish this stuff. It didn't work out very well. Hi, right? Um, just, I, I bought one from Armando years ago. And I drilled it, created some blowout, relapped it, yeah. tried like four different things to polish it. I didn't do very well. I think your method of just using fine abrasives. 
I like that one better. Okay, and then there's this one. Oh, Lynn. Not this one. Um, yeah, basically I used the belts from LapidaryTool.com um, for the 50,000, 50,000 belt. And we were just talking about the backing formula on this, on the piece that I bought from you. I thought it was an obsidian because of the way the light's playing with it. But it's probably something else. And you were telling me sometimes they use agates, which makes sense. There's a lot of... Um, yeah, so it's the agate without the pyrite. Very cool, and you can even see the seam there. Yeah. Lovely way, a lot better than DevCon. <laughs> no, it makes it durable, or, you know, especially for the pyrotized ammonites, they're more durable. Um, but then if the agate doesn't have any pyrite through it, it makes a good use of what you already have. See, here's one that's, that's hollow. Well. So you've been bringing this stuff over for years. I think I've, I've known you for maybe six years. So you've been doing it before that. How long has this been coming over? Um, I started really getting big into it in 2009. Okay, almost so, 15 years now. Yeah, huh? 14 years. But then like we were talking about, just were cut off from the supply. And they kind of indicated that even if the war ended tomorrow, it would take a little bit for people to get back in the groove of production. Absolutely. If, if they even did production, because the miner himself is getting old, and he made this, this may force him to retire. I think Glenn's got another shirt for you. I'm going to cut out all the shirt stuff, by the way. Uh, no, I don't want that one. I want the other one. <laughs> She's so funny. Friend of yours? Oh yeah, it's my grandma. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like being called grandma. It's okay. So also from Russia, super high end seraphonite and charite. Some people call this green charite. It's not a charite. No, uh, just it's you know basically seraphonite or seraphonite. Ser seraphonite. That's right. What is it velcro on there? No, it's just <laughs> it's just nice and perfectly flat. You guys can tell how it looks so similar. And since they're both Russian, um, it, when you see the rough, these are like big medallion, flower medallion looking rough and um, quite a bit different, but these are stunning pieces. These, they, these are also cut in Russia, I assume. These actually, um, a friend of mine cut this. Oh, well, they did a great yeah, job. Yeah, he's retired now, so I know. Have you seen Charite go up and down in price and up and down? Yeah, and I suspect right now it's going to be a little higher because, the, again, just the supply, supply and demand. Demand's as good as it's been, but the supply's less. So when I first got into a scene, you could expect something like this, $300 easy. This is $150 right now. And what I think lowered the price was for the casual stuff, like like this is obviously a higher quality than this, is when all the blocks came over. So I don't know when, but at one point in time, you could only bring over blocks. Like they decided you can't bring over raw rough anymore. You have to bring over blocks. If you've seen my um, Tucson videos, you've seen the stacks of blocks from LL, MPLLC and Tucson at the Kino show. <clears throat> and a few other people have those blocks. Those all seem to be really lower quality compared to like these just stunning pure purple ones. And, um, but I just think like that flush of lower end and more people cutting lower end and more mass producers like Nattery and Casper and those guys cutting that lower end stuff might have hurt the higher end stuff because for years I didn't see the, the cheap stuff with the matrix in it. I've only seen stuff like this. Lynn has a big piece like this from Grandma Jean and it said $300 on the back of it. This one here is 98, so it is quite a bit more affordable than it used to be. But um, my theory is because of the uh, influx of the more affordable stuff. But 
I do think the higher end is going to get up there in price again. Um, people like Casper and Attery and stuff who still in Tucson and they do the mass, produ mass production cuts. They uh, sell some pieces full of Matrix for as low as like 10, 20 bucks. Sometimes you could see smaller pieces for like five, but nothing this quality. This is Wild Horse, I believe, or um, similar in look to White Buffalo, but this is a Howlet, I believe, with a really lovely matrix, where, if you don't know, White Buffalo is actually um, Dolomite and Calcite. And then this turquoise here, all of this is number eight. I was talking to a gentleman about number eight yesterday, excuse me, I wasn't talking. I was reading a Facebook group called like Let's Talk Turquoise or something. And the gentleman was talking about, a gentleman was talking about how, how is there more number eight for sale, rough and lower quality than was ever mined? And so the story goes from a few different people, and some of them were even saying, hey, let's end this conversation now before things become hearsay, is that in the beginning, only high-end number eight stuff was coming out, the beautiful chocolatey matrix, and some of the stuff that was so dark blue, it looked like it could peak. One of which pieces can be seen at our Durango show um, from, is it Paul Leba? Phil Leba? And um, this is the more casual, higher quality, where the lower quality pieces can, like, that are heavily stabilized can, like, have, like, the, the, the resin's, like, 60 years old. It turned, like, green. It's turning green and yellow and it's rotting. Not like this. And um, so the story I heard from those people talking on the chat is that there was a guy who had tens of tons of the material and it was verified because one of the people in the chat said that they went and bought a couple tons of the lower quality number eight not the dark blue that looks like it took a peak and perhaps not even like this but um something similar to a lower quality piece which i'll put on screen right now for reference and that stuff i've seen as low as 175 dollars a pound um they were saying back in the day the high grade something like this maybe five hundred dollars a pound which now cheap turquoise is five hundred dollars a pound that looks nothing like this is a super cool great american turquoise um but the funny story they didn't want low grade to come out and they were so good at keeping the low grade from not coming out um maybe one person was getting it all it didn't come out until after he passed away that the influx of the lower grade material is baffling some old timers who just didn't see it everywhere like they do today there's probably six or seven people right in this show that are selling number eight and um i think this gentleman has the best this piece in particular is pretty fantastic They say there's over 30 looks to number eight. Uh, one of is called Eggshell, and that's an older style. And then there's some darker blue, like I said, looks like Ithaca Peak. Really cool stuff. Great prices on this on this on these pieces. I think these two are my favorite. My third would have to be that one. Great girdle. So I'm going to a nice silver jewelry. You guys look for another stone. I'm looking for some cool Demortray. So these are quartzes with Demortray crystals growing inside of them. When most people think of Demortray, they think of like the blue quartzite or they call it blue quartz and it's like from Brazil and it's just pure blue. Real basic stuff. Uh, these are the quartz pieces that have the crystals, the little wiry hairs growing inside of them. First time I've ever seen this type of Demortray was from John Conico. Um, John Conico now sells on a 
website on Facebook, oh, uh, group on Facebook. He does very well. Great cutter. Super cool stuff. Love those two pieces. Because you know, like the trend is, you know, the dig, more they dig, you end up like start getting more. Like, first batch is always the best. So it looks like a lot of this tray here is Royston, right? Um, this one for sure. Royston Turquoise, Cripple Creek, and then a mixture of uh, different locations. Cripple Creek. Cripple Creek, Colorado. Uh, did you buy this um, from the guy with the mohawk, or did you get? Did you have it before that gentleman was really in the scene? No, I bought it from somebody who bought it from him, and then. Uh, it can be quite a bit. Sometimes he wants like six dollars a carat, rough. Well, he was asking four point five thousand a pound. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. <laughs> um, is it um so i so cripple creek north star bad boys all kind of the same thing it's there's basically um there's the burtis blue yeah there's yeah the burtis, burtis blue the burtis blue mine the lone the uh, north star mine and the bad boys mine it's all in the same vein or the same you know the same cripple creek's the town right yeah, or the exactly. county exactly it's the town I can't believe you still have this one for the price. Yeah. That is... Well, so basically, I ended up buying it from somebody who was retired. And so Frank gave me a good deal on it. Um, they say that the second hardest piece of turquoise ever found was at in Cripple Creek, Colorado. Did you cut any of these pieces here? Yeah, so it's, it's, it cuts real... I mean, it's, it's a joy to cut because there's no surprises. It's really hard. In fact, it, uh, the 3000, once you're done with the 3000 wheel, your diamond wheels, like the Diamond Pacific diamond wheels, at 3000, um, it looks almost as well polished as a lot of things that have gone through uh, the next stage. Oh, yeah, like a whole compound or yeah, it's, maybe 14 grand. It or... is so silicated. These are awesome. I like that you cut them sideways because like from this piece of chunk, you probably could have got five or six pieces of ribbon. I would prefer to cut it long ways and get one killer banger. This wasn't actually the ribbon in that it was um, just turquoise on the top of the, the rough on the matrix. Oh, nice. And so the ribbon actually I sold out of. I did have some ribbon turquoise, but I sold out of it. So that's why this didn't cut into ribbons. It was just basically, uh, a fair amount of waste, but a good turquoise on the, the tips. You know, for years, um, well, at least since I got started, I would, I think, me and most people would assume that all Royston would be natural. And this year, last year in Denver, I saw Mr. Audison selling stabilized Royston turquoise, which is wild because, like. It was one of those ones you always could count on being natural. And I get it. you got to make money. You're going to use your waste. Yeah. You know, if you're finding less and less of, like... Right. Yeah. See, that's the thing. Is I always try to use natural, tur natural turquoise. Um, I think there's advantages and disadvantages to both at the natural and the stabilized. Um, but that's where with, like, Cripple Creek, you're only going to find natural. You're not going to find stable. Yeah, you probably would never need to... No. It, it's literally super hard, super silicated... You know, I like to talk about polishes really easily. Super easy. I can't thank you enough for your time, Rich. Sure, man. Thank you. Um, from here, you going to Buena Vista? Buena Vista. The Woodland Ready Park. to get sandblasted out there? <laughs> Two years ago, we got sandblasted in Woodland Park. That's another story. Um, yeah, so Buena Vista, the last couple of years, the weather in BV has actually been pretty good. So I hope we continue our trend. And hopefully, uh, we don't get the same windstorm that we had in. Uh, Wooden Park, because that was pretty, that was actually the worst outdoor show as far as sand and wind that I've ever done. Well, Buena Vista is a, a pretty big one and a pretty great one. And then after that, you do Denver? I do Denver. I'll be at the Miners Co-op this year. Nice. That's good. Um, does, does the Miners Co-op keep it more affordable than other places like an expo and the Coliseum and stuff? You know, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely more affordable. Uh, part of it is that I'm, you know, surrounded by more of my friends. So being a solo one-man operation is easier to get. How do you some, use the bathroom? Grab food. <laughs> How do you go get food? food? Make emergency phone calls. Grab food. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, I just would rather be outside. I'm just, you know, I spend a lot of time between shows outside. I have a hard time being in inside for 10 days. So that's yeah, part of it. So, Rich, um, folks can hit you up. Is this email still relevant? It is. Oh, you have an Etsy. They can contact you yeah, through there. That's, that's or brightstargems.com. Gemstones.com. Gemstones.com. Is that still relevant? And it uh, is. That, that email is good. And then I never have everything listed on my website. I need to get caught It's up. impossible. How? How? I need to get caught up. So that's my project after Denver. If somebody can always contact me. And I can send pictures. Free shipping, free returns. I want to make sure people are happy. Yeah, you don't want them to like it. You want them to love it. You know what? It's it's yeah, exactly. If they're not inspired by the stone, the jeweler's never going to set it, and it's just going to sit there. So I don't have a problem taking it back because I know each stone has its place. Um, it has its home, and I'd rather have it get the right home than have it be just something that's you know laying around on the workbench. On your website, do you have the piece that you won? the best lapidary of the year for the interweave reader's choice um that, actually that was for everything oh just in general in cutting general, yeah you know your booth I, got nominated yeah the whole booth the whole i didn't even know it i got back uh from tucson and about two weeks after i got home i actually had time to look at the tucson uh buyer's guy and it, it uh pleasant surprise definitely grateful for my customer support like, yeah it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I just wish I I wish I'd had more time during the show in Tucson to actually open the book and look. <laughs> and I was just getting caught up, and there it was, and uh, here we are. Did they give you any of the books for free? No. <laughs> oh that's, man, that's okay. You know, it's all good. I got the word got out, and I just printed up the little, you know, um, cards to let people know. Absolutely. I'll try to find it online to show people yeah, to write up on the yeah, I'll add it to the video I've seen it online also I think it's uh, there's a link something says about uh, you know uh, readers choice awards awesome thanks Richard sure likewise thank see you. you soon I'll see you in Buena Vista and then I'll see you in Denver that's just it you'll, you'll do good <laughs>
Here are my good friend Jay and Jay's booth, who have a great spread of the sow belly material. This piece in particular is pretty great. A big agate formation shape stuff going right through the middle. And uh, these folks are super cool and kind enough to let me check out their uh, right up here on the material. Because there's a lot of material coming out of Mineral County. But I think a lot of people who aren't from here or even close to here, when they think of Creed, they think of the sow belly or the silver ore. Uh, but that's a lot less common at other gem shows. Like all the way in Durango, people were selling this. In Quartzsite, I saw a few people selling a few pieces. So Creed, sow belly. I think a lot of people think of banded amethyst with agate and quartz. Are they the same write-ups? Yeah. Are these the same write-ups? Uh -huh, yeah. Oh, cool. I'm going to read that one. That one's a little bit easier on my eyes. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, this one's it, beautiful. Well, it, but it, uh, the, it talks about the met, met, metaphysical poly, uh, properties, properties of the amethyst. And, and as I told you, where it came from was an old miner in the 1950s took it home when he ended his shift and just piled it up and it stayed there in the pile for 70 years. Oh, I see that these write-ups are two different write-ups, yeah, actually. They're not, they're not the same. Both worth reading, then. <laughs> oh, this, rare min this rare mineral, mineral <laughs> combination called sow belly agate by collectors was found in Amethyst Fault Zone, located at 10,000 feet above sea level above the early mining town of Creed, Colorado. Creed is about 8,000, right? Uh, I think that, I think that's what... 92. Close, to, not enough for the people I hang out with. So it's 1,000 feet up from here, so it would be like over there somewhere maybe? Oh, you mean the, the mines? Yeah, they're above Creed, and uh, probably about 1,000 feet above Creed is where the mines actually started. Oh, wow. Well, they came down from uh, Bachelors and dropped down. You know, they had a little town off of Bachelors, what you call Bachelors. Does it exist still? No, it just... Uh, well, when it just, you could see where it was. Yeah, because oh, yeah. there's no trees. No, wow. Uh, and it was a pretty big town, but that's where miners... It was easier to drop down than it is to climb it up every day. Oh, that's, and I complain about, you know, people waking up and going to work in the garage cutting rocks. Imagine waking up before the sunrise, going, coming home, six days a week. and the sun is yeah. down when you're coming out of the mine. It, oh, man, we're you, spoiled. Yeah, you don't have enough. You don't have much appreciation for how tough those guys were. Those miners were. And a lot of them were uh, come in from another country. Really? They hired out, out, outsourced you know, labor? They, you know, they were migrants that came in. They were, used, they were used to working in mines in other countries. I had no idea. So, I mean, I guess it's probably good if, like, if you're going to outsource, get people who also did mining. And... Yeah, yeah, they were used to mining, so they moved out of the mine. I'm going to leave. The bars. Famous early mines with names like Last Chance, Commodore, followed these amethyst fault zones for miles inside the mountains looking for silver. And from the 1890s, the Creed, Colorado Mining District has produced over 80 million ounces of silver. Interesting. Very cool. With agate and quartz layers, sow belly is found only in Creed, Colorado Mining District. Dug out of the early silver mines of, over 70 years ago. Famous early mines like the Last Chance and the Commodore. Okay, we read that. So the metaphysical properties of amethyst in general, I believe, is, uh, I guess, not quite the metaphysical property, but the kind of like scientific makeup, right? <clears throat> this is the metaphysical properties of protection, purification, excellent for helping to break old and bad habits, like sticking my camera in front of people's boots all the time. <laughs> Fantastic write-up. Stimulates the crown chakra, 
helps the hair grow back then, huh? <laughs> See, I need my I need my crown talk. You're stimulated. <laughs> helps ward off negativity in one's environment. Can bring the feelings that one is surrounded by a bubble of light. Oh, okay. Fantastic. We tumbled. Kinds of stuff, kinds of wraps here. Did buy a few pieces of the slabs from this gentleman yesterday. <sighs> Very cool. Did you do all the slabbing yourself? You must have got a big saw. Two foot. Never heard anybody call the 24 inch two foot. Is it a Highland Park or a Phantom or? Highland Park. Nice. Is your favorite pieces the pure amethyst or the ones with the amethyst and the agate inside? The amethyst and the agate. Pretty yeah, me too. This but one that's is pretty hard not to like. It's fantastic. So all of these are for sale, but at home, do you have a private collection of like the best pieces you ever ran across? This is pretty much it. So people sell their collection. I, I sell my collection. You ever run across any pieces that are too big for uh, your saw? Oh yeah. Oh, wow, there's some big ones out there, huh? Did you get into lapidary arts because of this material or which is always in the rocks? Well, I worked in the mines here, so you ended up... What, really? What other, um, any other rocks that are worth cutting that come out of there? Oh, there's a, a lot of silver, native silver out of it. Oh, mine stunning. Too. And, um, man, when, when did it, people stop mining the mine? 80s, 1980s. Is that when you retired? Hunt Brothers tried to corner the silver market and killed it. Oh, no. All the mines closed. How many miners were there at any one time? 50. 50? So those are your brothers down there, huh? And everybody by name. They left town. How old were you when you started? 19. Whoa. <laughs> Was it scary at first or? It was a job. One dollar forty cents an hour. $1.40. 68. What were you driving back then? An old Chevy. I got an old Chevy. Not old enough. <laughs> Not as old as this gentleman Chevy. Thank you, Ken, for your kindness. You have, I think, some of the best examples of this material here. Um, these two aren't priced. Do you have a price for those? That's great. How much is your t-shirt? 20. Ken was just telling me the black in there is argentite and acantite. I like the opaque ones. The most, I think. Can't wait to cut this. Yes, sir. Just picked up these. These are Holly Blues from Oregon. Yep. And uh, I noticed that he actually had a piece of the blue Holly Blue. I had to get it. <laughs> it's priced really nicely, and your tumbling's really good. You know, um. 
do you ever do you if you don't mind me asking sir on your when you're tumbling and you're making pieces like this you're probably slicing these up from a rough rock before you put them in a tumbler are you taking out any saw marks before you put them in the tumbler just doing it right the first time with the sawing not leaving too many record marks and stuff no, just the, the tumbling takes them out. Takes out. Oh, the, for me, I'll end up with a bunch of polished scratches. Well, polished gouges. You know where where the rock breaks right at the beginning or the end. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll leave a little tab there. I might grind that off from the grinding wheel. You know, if there's a, oh, exactly. Yeah, where it breaks off there. instead yes, of yes. But the uh, actual saw marks, I don't uh, take them out. No, I just uh, put it in the rough grind and do the rough grind until they're gone. Thank you so much, brother. And this big one here is also spectacular. Too bad you don't take a card, I'm gonna have to hit him. You take a card. You take a card? Yeah. I'll take this one then too. Alright. That one's really cool. I'm gonna make pendants out of these. I got a uh, really nice water drill, a Gunther water swivel. I'll drill this thing in two seconds. Oh, really? What kind of I'll show you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll show you here in a second. Drilling a hole is a... Uh, I'll It'll never drill figure out how to do that. like butter. But here's the problem. It will only is it drill... Ultrasonic? No. Oh. It's a chuck that goes in the chuck of a drill press with a, with a proprietary German drill bit. Squirts water through it. Oh, yeah. And it's... it's um, you only get about 600 holes out of it, but I think it pays for itself. The bit's $35, which is a little pricey, but you can't make your money back on 600 holes. How big a hole? Any size you want. They'll do up to a half millimeter, which is the most difficult to do. You have to really pack it um, up small. into like 15, 16, maybe 20. And that, you, I can crank down on a jade like butter. Here's the problem. It will not polish soft rocks. I mean, it won't drill soft rocks. Anything that won't core. So it's oh, soft rocks it's turns to mud and it explodes. Uh, is this Bruno? Yeah. Where is Bruno from? You're like you, you, no, I think it's. Is in it from Colorado? Idaho. Idaho. Okay, that makes sense. I believe so. Idaho, Washington, Oregon border area. A lot of people today, I think, less and less are as obsessed with the uh, natural colored jaspers. Mm. I love Bruno, I love Biggs, I love this. Have you ever seen the Royal Sahara from Egypt? No. It looks like little bugs. Oh really? But it's all brown on brown and I think the, kid, the kids want the labradorites and the, and you know, the stuff like that. And I am so obsessed with brown jaspers <laughs> from uh, living in the Southern California area. It's a big jasper agate town. Uh -huh. They're not as into turquoise as I am. Uh, they're really into agates and jaspers. Did you take that one out? Yes, I'm gonna give you a card for that here okay. in a second. Just still admiring your work. This, it, like this and this turquoise over here, how do you buy one? It's like something you hang on the wall. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I wouldn't want just that one. I want them all and I want to like frame it. Yeah, yeah. What is your favorite piece uh, out of everything you're selling here? Ask the hard questions, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hard to know. These are all fantastic. Are they all Chihuahua? I like the big scenes, I guess. Maybe I'd lean towards that if I had to say what is favorite, but it's That's hard. tough. Did you cap those two? They're all so different. Oh, for sure. Did you, you, know, you? Everything's different. Did you make these cabochons? Um, Somebody in America did. So. They're not. They're I not like calibrated. Because everything that I've ever bought that was pre-made, and I thought, oh, good, I can just still put a label on these and sell them. Did I get home and look at them under good light? And said, oh, dang, they're. I got to rework these. They're garbage. You know, they're. they're, they're oh, they're, right. The polish job isn't good, or they got big scratches in the crown. Something. Definitely a book match pair, huh? Yep. Same rock. Yep. Oh yeah, definitely. Tens of thousands of hours in these trays. <laughs> do you use a lapidary grinder as well? Oh yeah. What is uh, what I type of machine do you like? I got a genie. Oh heck yeah! Messing with the best, leave with everything else yeah. to the rest. Yeah. 
I tell people, you know, all the machines spin at the same speed, 1750, 1800 RPM, but Diamond Pacific wheels, nobody can argue that those are not the best. Yeah. yeah. They last the longest. They seem to last the longest. Um, I had, originally I had an old uh, Highland Park machine. Like an old, like, machine. three wheels or four wheels with the big yeah. leather on the side? Yeah, well, they were, uh, yeah, no, they were actually cover on them wheels. So they weren't even diamond. And, uh, Silicon carbide. So I got a, I got a genie in, in uh, you know, equi I used to buy equipment, you know, and carry it around, but I don't remember. But anyway, so I called this old guy up in our club that I know. It's been doing lapidary forever. And uh, I said, what's this genie worth, you know, when I go to sell it? And he goes, have you tried it? I said, no. He goes, try it before you sell it. <laughs> I tried it once and I said, I sold the Honda Bark. <laughs> yeah, the genie's nice. I, it is nice. Um, and uh, people who are considered buying their first machines sometimes are worried about spacing and room. It's rare that I don't have room. Oh, and did you ever know that the right side of the machine, the wheels come off? Uh, they the adapter, on. like the adapter, and you could set it up with one wheel on the side if you need it. Like if you're making a giant ceremonial pipe or something, it's what is what kind of turquoise is that? I don't know. It looks really know. good. Yeah, if I knew, I would have labeled it. But you know, my guess is it's out of China, but that's a total guess. I have no idea where it came out of an old uh, state. That is beautiful. Do you ever back your turquoise? No. Cool. I'm all, I, I back a lot of my turquoise, but here's the trick about backing. When you're buying a, ca a cab of Bisbee for $30 a carat in Tucson, how much how, how much money are you spending on $30 a carat for Devcon or resin and stuff? Even if it's three carats, it's $100 worth of plastic. And it's tough. Yep. yep. What there is... are some in here that are backed, but I didn't. I got them that way. Mm -hmm. I didn't back them <clears throat> like that one. <clears throat> Yeah, that looks like DevCon. There's a gentleman outside who's backing with records. Like, goes to the thrift store, buys records. And it's cheaper than DevCon and all that stuff. This is a really cool slab. Yeah. Maybe Sonoran turquoise? It's Mexico, but... Yeah, Mexico is all I know. Be a shame to cut that up. I think it would be. Let me... The, the reason why I ask you if you're buying out like estate sales and like older collections because this El Chivo, I don't think you're El Chivo, Chivo Ferrero. That's you? Yes, oh, nice. <laughs> I didn't know you were a gunslinger before you were a rock collector. Oh, I never heard of a gunslinger <laughs> by that name. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's awesome. Actually, it is named after a truck I Oh, fantastic. What kind of truck was it? It's a Toyota, yeah, by Toyota pickup. It's got everything off-road. I mean, if it can be, if it can have off-road after work, it's definitely, it's got it. Do you have a picture of it? No, I don't. No, I don't. This is a really cool piece of amethyst. You wouldn't mind running the card again, would you? No. Because I think I, I think I have to have this. Definitely take that. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna hold it one more time to show it off on the camera. It's just a weird piece. And you think most people would you see that and you think it'd be like the inside of a geode, but it's not. It's kind of just a cool curved amethyst piece. A lot of people pick that one. Yeah, I, I'm taking that one home. <laughs> Very cool. Where do you begin with the specimen spreads, you know? Oh, this is cool. Unpolished specimen of crazy lace. They have names for all the natural <clears throat> things going on with a agate specimen. I don't know the name. Sometimes they call them peelers and uh, I don't know all that. There's, check out the agate dude on social media. You'll learn all the agate terminology. Smithsonite. 
you think this, they've got giant's bones down in the Smithsonian somewhere with Indiana Jones's <laughs> stuff? <laughs> Now, a lot of people put out everything they have. Do you have a private collection at home of, of your favorite stuff? That's cool. I have my own collection, it's not for sale. I sold off most of my own collection. I have a turquoise collection, but uh, not a specimen collection anymore. That's cool that you have one. Because one day, someone might come by and just buy you out, and then you'd have nothing to show for it. Yeah. Well, I got lots of stuff in Do you still have El Chivo, the truck? Yep. Cool. <laughs> I'm thinking about something. Oh, no. It's beautiful. Because I've never used it. Sonoran copper specimen. <laughs> I wonder how close the copper is coming from the, me from the turquoise that's coming out of Sonora. Maybe not so far, maybe the opposite side of the state. Whoa, that is cool. Isn't that a cute breeze? Yeah, gotta stand it up. Teller? Teller, Colorado. Where's that? Teller County. Teller County. Uh, it's around the five, Lake George, kind of that area. I don't know where the exact boundaries are. These are all the Zimbabwe and Nambia. Have you ever find the anhydros in these ones? I haven't looked. I got a bunch at home, I've never looked, and I hear it's not particularly rare. What really? are these? Oh, just Chalcedony flowers, I guess you call them. I've never seen, I mean, I've definitely seen like this, but I've never seen so many that they must all be coming from the same place and it's a common formation for that area. Yeah, yeah, the guy I got these from collected them, and he says it's getting really hard to find good ones. Like People are going on? Yes, it just you have to hike so far oh, wow. you know, because it's been so he picked it, over. Uh, snakeskin agate, but I think it's the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some cold, cold bulb things. We had a friend in Nevada who came back with a really nice chunk of agate. Uh, yeah. It's pretty cool, tumbled up too. He thought it was a fossil at first. Ah. And he kind of had me going, and then we, we figured it out. Some really cool scenic natural color jaspers. You don't happen to have a Geiger counter on you, do you? No, don't. Excuse me, part I just couldn't get I have to buy them and just taste the radiation myself, I guess. <laughs> Is this a tumbled version of the alligator? Yes. Where is it from? Uh, southern New Mexico. Southwestern New Mexico. Whoa, is this an egg? No, it's a sand dollar. It's a sand dollar, yeah. These are really cool, unique ammonites. Yeah. 
Everybody sees the calcite kind, but the colorful ones are definitely kind of special. Mexico. I bought a piece of this from a gentleman oh, that, at okay. Buena Vista. It's from Silverton. And he was calling it rhodonite, but some people give it another name. Pyrox mangite. Pyrox mangite. And is it is it just not a rhodonite? And or is it just the story the way I got it was somebody tested it. They paid to have a lab tested. And every specimen they tested came up Pyrox mangite, not rhodonite. But everybody calls it rhodonite. And they're very similar. And you can't tell the difference by looking at them. In my opinion, I like the Pyrox mangite because it makes this, pe this material a little bit more regional, a little bit more special. Because you get rhodonite from everywhere you know i just call it road night because that's what everybody calls it <laughs> but at least you know you, you yeah. got the knowledge and i appreciate yeah. you sharing that with me yeah. pyrox I used to label them pyrox mingai and then everybody go oh, road night and i go okay <laughs> and some people think that the metal in here is a silver ore do you think it might be or uh, i don't know about that did, certainly silver mines around you know or around silverton all around did, there did you polish this on a yeah. uh flat, uh, flat lap, uh, flat lap? not just a flat lap vibro lap Rotate. Really? A, flat, a real flat lap. Okay, yeah. this took time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I thought like maybe you sawed it, put it on the vibro. It's faster doing it than the vibro for the sure. Vibro but but it, you have to be there. The vibro machine, that's right. You gotta be sitting there <laughs> holding it. Exactly. Exactly. Really, really good polish on this, brother. Thank you. Like, so good. I love flat, doing flat polish, that's my thing. So good. At first, I thought you clear coated it. And then I got in there and I'm like, okay, I can see like different pieces of matrix being softer and being undercut. Oh, a really good job, dude. Thank you. If you don't mind me asking, is your old, is your, is your flat lap older? It's a homemade flat lap that cool. the machine is made. Magnetic? No. Silicon carbide slurry. Yeah. Very cool. Slurry, exactly. Very it's cool. Very cool. I hear, especially in England, which is this is a hobby over there. They don't really have like a scene like we do. Oh. Uh, that that is the thing for agates. It is the slurry, okay. and um, where like diamond, you get particles that are that a gouge, and some of them are. I found that if you go much bigger than a quarter size, and this is just my experience, maybe mm -hmm. I'm doing something wrong. But if, if the stone is much bigger around than a quarter, doing it on diamond takes four. You can't put enough pressure. You can't. I mean, I'm standing. It's kind of hydroplaning over, and it's like the diamond's not really in. Well, this flat lap diamond is not centered. Yeah, I've got it's a, plated. I've got an eight inch, uh, small. You got a high tech or something? Uh, it, actually, a tool. It's an old machine. Cool. It's an old, Heck yeah. I use a fastening machine as a flat lap too. Machine. But I try to, and anything over than about that size is just, I can't, it takes forever. It takes forever. Now, for this piece of scenic, Jasper, oh no, it's still really polished. You did this too. Yep. Man, you're good. You're real <laughs> good. Thank you. That's my thing, just doing the flat. I want the flat. I mean, I make the caps too, but I really like doing the flat. Where did you get the New Zealand jade? So here's what I heard. Old, old, old school, that makes sense. Is all New Zealand jade Ponamu? I don't know. I don't know. Someone out there watching from New Zealand would know. Um, Just give me some more. Oh, okay. So the story I heard, much like charite, where it has to be worked in a specific way before it can come to America, is that they don't want rough or that rough cannot come to America. It has to be worked. And uh, there's been examples of this for different rocks from different countries around the world. And sometimes I see that to polish a little window. I think it was, it was the Ponamu that I heard for years they would polish a window on it and they would consider that worked and they would come over. But obviously they want it to be made into tokis, made into sculptures, made into anything but just sliced, calling it a slab art and sending it over here. If I'm not mistaken, maybe... No, I was going to say Myanmar, Jane. I heard that because I see rough, big boulders of Myanmar, 
charge it all the time. Now, things turning over ethically or illegally and all that kind of stuff, that's debatable and I'm sure it's easier in countries that, um, you know, are easily more corruptible, but money talks everywhere, right? That's a beautiful thing about it. Uh, it's a really cool spread of jade. All different kinds. It all looks like nephrite to me. <laughs> really affordable too. Fortunately, I'm not the best at my jade identifying. But I love that. Uh, I love the rind on the outside. I don't really want to cut a lot of single pieces of jade independence that don't have the rind. Sometimes it just serves the design, but I'm just so addicted to that outer rind. Definitely Wyoming, BC. But also some other stuff. This is probably black. Wyoming, maybe? I just, I can't tell you. One of those rocks where I'm completely stumped. These, even though they don't have the rind on the outside of all of them, these are just fantastic. Earrings. That's what I think of these all day long. This is what's the minerals inside of here? Is it actinolite or that other stuff? Again, I don't know. Jade. I love it. Sold out of almost my entire collection. I sold my white jade. I sold my apple blossoms. I just like that this is it says jade on it. This is awesome. Great spread, great prices too. Um, I really want to go to the Santa Cruz Jade Festival. It's called. Is it the Big Sur Jade Festival in October? I don't know. I want to go to it though. Super stoked. Huh. One of those. Two of the same materials. Totally different looks. Like Power Rangers. Fancy jaspers. I like to call it fancy bloodstone because it's obviously a jasper. Fancy jasper's probably better. Bloodstone probably creeps people out. And a little tiny piece far, far away from home. It's the Ricolite from Grand County, New Mexico. This serpentine, I believe. For two bucks, I will be buying these. I like this a lot. It's got metal in it, looks like hematite or something. It's worth next to nothing in price. And my lunch is going to cost me 10 times the price for me and Lynn. <laughs> Lapis, uh, marinating in flies. Weef. The wind is kicking up and you're in, the, in a good spot to get away from it. <laughs> 
Some cool crazy laces. What is in there that makes it yellow and green? Someone please let me know. I hear that Tiffany stone is uh, fluorescent. Is it that stuff that's making it fluorescent? like rocks that's a joke of course they do Looks like tool, but they pronounce it tool. So why aren't you packing that on the vein? Or does it matter? It doesn't matter. Okay. I just crack it around the best. How much was that one? Um, this one is 20. Here it goes. I can feel the tension. I guess it's flat now. Close your eyes. I'm just kidding. It's fine. I love this. <laughs> Oh, 
has amethyst. Look at that. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, cool. These aren't those just boring, cheap Moroccan coconut geodes, huh? So what are the, what these are the awesome. Oh, these what is the orange? That's iron oxide, and if you want it to come out of there, just put it in iron out, and you'll get the iron off of it, and it'll all be with us. I like leaving the dirt in there. I'm a dirty boy. Yeah. I like the dirt in there. <laughs> That's awesome. Exactly. No, exactly. So if you if you don't have the polishing equipment, you can like clear coat it. Okay. Sure. Stainless, stainless steel Did pipe you see or it? cast iron pipe. Did it break? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Where are you guys from?